Hello everyone. Welcome to a video on an amazing writer that every one of us know a lot about. The pioneer of modernism, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was born in America in 1888. Then he emigrated to England, became an English citizen. That was in 1927. He also converted from Unitarianism to Anglicanism and became the greatest writer of the 20th century perhaps with the poem The Wasteland. So T.S. Eliot was a great poet but he was also a very major critic and also a playwright. I'm sure these are all common knowledge. Everybody knows a lot of things about T.S. Eliot, isn't it? T.S. Eliot was a pioneering writer because he encouraged a lot of other writers. He worked in Faber and Faber and he edited the Criterion where The Wasteland was published. He established the traditions of modernism thereby inspiring a lot of writers to follow that tradition. Eliot was born in St. Louis in Missouri and uh, he was from a New England family. From the 17th century ancestors had come to New England, from England to New England in America and Eliot belonged to that ancestry. It's very important because he has written about his ancestors in books like Four Quartets. Eliot was a student of Harvard University where he studied philosophy. He was inspired by new humanists like Irving Babbitt and he wanted to bring in the entire Western tradition into his writing because this was a time when society was degenerate, when literature was fragmented as you can see in the wasteland. And the new humanists went back to a renaissance ideal of a complete gentleman. There was also the new critics at this time of which T.S. Eliot was a part. New criticism, T.S. Eliot was a part of it. New criticism upheld the values of uh, tradition. As you know, F.R. Lewis wrote The Great Tradition. And uh, the new critics had a very formalist approach to literature. T.S. Eliot also upheld the same approach. Eliot showed that the focus should be not on the poet, not on the artist, but on poetry. He showed that impersonality is what we need in poetry and criticism. As you might know, he discussed this in tradition and the individual talents. And his foundations in philosophy gave him a very unique approach to literature, life and tradition. It was at the beginning of the First World War in the year 1914 that he left America and settled in Britain. And eventually, after a decade, he became a British citizen. At this time, he had a troubled marriage. His uh, wife Vivian also eventually had uh, psychological problems and uh, she was put in, in an, uh, an asylum under treatment. Later, after her death, Eliot remarried uh, a colleague who worked with him in Faber and Faber. Valerie, her name was. And uh, for some time, Eliot was edited, uh, editor of The Egoist, which was a very major periodical of this time, as you might know. And then he became editor of The Criterion. This is the time when he had written a very fragmented long poem, which eventually became The Wasteland. Originally, the title of The Wasteland was He Do the Police in Different Voices. I will talk about all this in detail. This is just by way of introduction. And The Wasteland was edited by Ezra Pound and he published it in the first edition of the Criterion in 1922. So this is a pioneering moment. At this time, as I told you, Eliot was working with Faber and Faber. 
which enabled him to encourage a lot of younger uh, writers. But he was not only uh, a publisher working in Faber and Faber, he was a banker and he loved his banking job also interestingly. Eliot was definitely uh, influenced by Ezra Pound and I told you he was influenced by the new humanists. There were many philosophers in Harvard like George Santayana who also influenced T.S. Eliot. Now at this time in France there was symbolism which was an avant-garde movement that laid the foundations of modernism. Symbolists like Charles Baudelaire, Jules Laforge etc. were major influences on Eliot. And these writers are also featured in the wastelands. The symbolist movement had been introduced into uh, England at this time by Arthur Simmons's book, Symbolist Movement in Literature. This book influenced not only Eliot, but many other modernists as well as earlier writers like W.B. Yeats. And uh, T.S. Eliot worked in close uh, connection with the new critics, especially F.R. Leavis. It was F.R. Leavis, so to say, who uh, discovered the genius of T.S. Eliot. So, this is the man who laid the foundations of modernism. Now, you must be interested in knowing more about his works. Let me tell you about his early poems first. All of you might know, his, one of his earliest poems was the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. This is a poem when he was, writ, uh, he, he wrote it when he was still a student at Harvard. And the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is like a, a symbol or a metaphor for the modernist condition. The modern man who is lonely and disoriented, who is directionless, that kind of a man is Alfred Prufrock. It appeared in the American magazine Poetry and uh, then it was printed in Proof Rock and Other Observations. That was an early collection that came in 1917 while the First World War was still happening. And uh, this poem is about a man, Alfred Proof Rock. He is going to meet probably a girlfriend or fiancé or female friend. And it looks like he usually meets her, has coffee with her, but nothing much comes out of that relationship. They don't have a very deep relationship. He doesn't get to uh, propose to her or proceed with the relationship. That is the feeling that we get. He is a little neurotic and he is talking in a fragmented manner. It is not a story that he tells us. It is not a very clear mind that we see reflected in this poem. It is a fragmentary, disoriented man's mind talking about various impressions of life and of himself. We know he is a failure. He is um, not able to be in control of his own life. This is reflected in the language of the poem itself. The poem begins very famously with a conceit. Let us go then you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky. So far is good, but then the conceit comes, like a patient etherized upon the table. That is not what we expect. We expect a very romantic description of the evening. But he goes on to say that it is like a patient anesthetized on the operation table, the evening. This gives us an impression of redness, probably of blood, probably of stasis and inaction. This is a very dramatic beginning. Let's go then you and I. It is a conversational beginning. The poet, uh, the speaker is talking to us or to somebody and eventually we realize that we don't make sense of, we don't make head and tail of this story. What is happening here? Nothing much is happening. Like in James Joyce's uh, Dubliners, it is a paralytic state. It is a stasis of modern life that you see here. Now, uh, as we know, this is a conversational poem. And then we realize it's a dramatic monologue. 
in a like a stream of consciousness manner the mind of proof rock is being revealed and i told you the fragmentary condition of his mind is reflected in the breakdown of language itself language itself is breaking down here so many different kinds of poetic forms uh, are brought together in this poem some lines are repeated without meaning and also there are absurd rhymes that he is using to create a comic effect to evoke the absurdity of the situation of proof rock and uh, there are very important uh, quotes that you might want to know you might already know in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo why michelangelo of all people it is actually an absurd rhyme in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo and we know women talking about michelangelo doesn't make really any sense and it's not that women should not talk about michelangelo but it is unexpected it is atypical and it is probably meaningless and he says i have measured out my life with coffee spoons sometimes we just meet people spend time with them discuss things and nothing gets done nothing ever gets done because meetings after meetings after meetings go on and action doesn't take place so look at it in a very classical way words uh, sorry look at it in a very classical way t s eliot is actually critiquing the inaction of modern society remember in classicism action is very important action is very important why do i keep saying classicism remember t s eliot is a classicist in literature a conservative in politics and an anglo catholic in religion he himself said that and modernism is a classical approach in the sense modernism wants order modernism wants meaning modernism is lamenting the breakdown of order and meaning so uh, this is a poem that longs for order and meaning but alas there is no order no meaning in modern life okay so that is an early uh, poem that is very famous prescribed in universities it is very very important that you read these poems the love song of j alfred proofrock is a short poem you can read it please do it then uh, another uh, very important poem is gerontian remember uh, in this early period he brought out a collection of poems it was in 1919 the same year as tradition as the tradition and the individual talent came that is when he brought out a collection of poems and gerontian is one of the poems in that collection gerontian is also a dramatic monologue or an interior monologue it is also a short poem now both love song and gerontian has have um, epigraphs the epigraph of uh, love song of j alfred proofrock is taken from dante's inferno where a character from dante's inferno is talking to dante the narrator and telling him i will tell you my sins because i know you will not go back to the world and tell them about it that means dante the friend of dante who is in hell is saying dante i will tell you my sins because i'm sure you will not go back and tell the world about my sins what does that mean it means dante is trapped he cannot go back he is trapped in hell like that proof rock is telling us reader in the epigraph that is the meaning of the epigraph it is like telling the reader reader i will tell you my sins i will tell you about my life because you are also part of this wasteland you are also a proof rock so it is the decadence of modern life that uh, is represented in these poems gerontian also is a poem of decadence and stasis as i told you it is a dramatic monologue spoken by an old man to a young boy the young boy is reading out to him the old man is uh, disab uh, uh, disabled he is not part of larger social life probably not disabled in the sense uh, he, because he is old he is not uh, in the prime of his life anymore uh and i don't mean he is disabled physically i mean that he is not 
part of uh, social life anymore and he is reflecting on the life around him the society around him the opening is an epigraph from measure for measure thou hast nor youth nor age that is the opening epigraph it is about Jeronshian of course and incidentally like the wasteland like uh, love song of j alfred proofrock like the later poem hollow men Jeronshian also talks about um, a decay um, uh, breakdown of modern life and society so these poems are called the wasteland cycle of poems the wasteland the cycle of poems include Jeronshian, the wasteland love song of j alfred proofrock and the hollow men now in Jeronshian, you see the man speaking and like in love song you see the fragmentary nature of his mind it is a discordant collage like uh, poem where everything is not you know uh, ordered and nothing uh, you know gives meaning now Jeronshian is talking about his own personal life he is also talking about so many uh, authors and alluding to their works such as Chapman, Ben Jonson, Shakespeare, Bible etc. There are so many intertextual connections and he is talking also about Christ and comparing Christ to, to Tiger as in Blake etc. So this is a poem that is like a prelude to the wasteland because it gives us a very good background of the modern society the fragmented life in modern society the meaninglessness of existence in modern society and the Jeronshian the poem is an early poem uh, and it came in 1919 in poems collection then there is the wasteland the wasteland is a poem from 1922 as you know it is one of the greatest poems in the 20th century in 20th century literature you know at this time there was vast major profound changes in modern society from the victorian period there was increasing commercialization and urbanization cities were being formed life had become uh, like wandering people came to the city and wandered without roots they did not belong to the city they, they were uh, leading a mechanized life at this time there were many political upheavals there were bloody revolutions from the 19th century itself and then there was the first world war before that the Boer wars the Crimean war it was a time of great unsettlement people were uh, migrating from one place to the other as I told you and uh, the bourgeois society the materialistic society was ruling money determined everything the age-old values of humanism had all disappeared families were breaking down society was breaking down there was a loosening of uh, morality and sex taboos and in this world like you see in the uh, store in the in the films of Charlie Chaplin the films of Charlie Chaplin haven't you seen working class man struggling to make a living struggling to exist uh, struggling to survive you know that was the typical modern condition Charlie Chaplin's movies are uh, representations of the modern predicament this is the same predicament that is reflected in the wasteland so this is a world where all morality spirituality have has all um, eroded it is a world where meanings of the humanistic period have all been replaced by mechanization and fragmentation paranoia hysteria and in the wasteland we see such kind of characters these characters do not belong they are uh, alienated from their uh, background they do not have supporting families they are living in a death in life condition they are all alive but they are so alienated and so um, hollow men that it is like they are living like death in life existence 
and this death in life existence this in between existence is represented by the so called protagonist of the wasteland who is tiresias tiresias does not appear in the wasteland from beginning to end like a hero in a mainstream movie tiresias is not like hamlet in the play hamlet he doesn't even appear properly we don't see him in the first two sections in the second section just a glimpse of tiresias we see we know that tiresias is the protagonist because eliot himself said it otherwise we wouldn't know tiresias is a mythical prophet who lived an in between existence he was neither man nor woman because he was a man with female breast he was partly female and he was neither dead nor alive he lived a long 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 life we don't know uh, whether he was a zombie or not he was neither blind nor sighted because he was blind but uh, he couldn't he he had an insight into things he had a far sight into things so he lived an in between existence liminal existence tiresias is the objective correlative in the wasteland for all the characters in the wasteland tiresias is a symbol or metaphor every character is like tiresias and uh, tiresias is one of the mythical elements in the wasteland the wasteland is completely a mythical poem it uses the mythical method as t s eliot himself has talked about now what are the other myths in the wasteland let us see well, the wasteland is replete with full of mythical references as all of you might know the most important of these is the myth of the fisher king the myth of the quest for holy grail uh, etc uh, as you again might already know the wasteland draws from at least two major books at least because there are so many intertextual connections that you can find in the wasteland but mainly it draws from jesse westerns from ritual to romance uh, that came in 1920 and even before that there was another book that was inspiring for the wasteland it is james fraser's the golden bough both these are anthropological texts talking about mythology and anthropology bringing together magic and religion and beliefs and in these books we have the myth of the wasteland the myth of the fisher king etc the fisher king is a very important figure from ancient mythology you can see the fisher king as a symbol of infertility of the land that is brought by sin in the wasteland sin is equated with sexual perversion uh misuse of sexuality lack of spiritual uh connection in sexual relationship is what leads to moral degeneracy and metaphorically it leads to infertility the fisher king represents an infertile land land and the search for fertility this connects with the myth of the holy grail because it is the holy grail or the cup from which jesus is supposed to have drunk if you bring that cup if you search and find it and bring that holy grail to your land then you can revive fertility that is the myth you see in arthurian legends and medieval legends the quest for the holy grail percival is the knight in arthurian legends who goes in search of the holy grail and this theme of fertility also automatically relates to ancient primitive myths and also greco roman myths perverse sexuality is uh, a very important concept and theme in greek mythology also rape of uh, women like proserpina and last lustful uh, relationships etc abound in greek mythology so using these expressions and um, objective correlatives of sinfulness eliot is trying to show that what the modern life needs is purity it is purgation you have to purge your sins and become pure you have to be reborn that is the central theme of the wasteland which he brings about which he affects um, through the use of the mythical method from the beginning of the wasteland you can see a series of symbols of debasement and infertility and sinfulness uh presented through objective correlatives like the corrupted or pollu 
polluted river Thames, people who are wandering in the metropolis, directionless, etc. And then he moves on to show uh, how bad the condition of the wasteland is from the burial of the dead to game of chess. He shows this through a series of uh, fragmentary experiences of the people who are all representations of Tiresias in a way or the other. All the characters in the wasteland are in a way or the other like Tiresias. That is why Tiresias is the protagonist. And then in the third section, fire sermon, he suggests solutions. You have to burn in fire. You have to purge. That meaning is introduced there through the sermons of Buddha and Saint Augustine. And then in the fourth section of the wasteland, he suggests death by drowning. You know that in ancient fertility cults, drowning of the idol is a very important. In Ganesh Chaturthi in India, for example, the submerging of the idol in the water is a metaphoric drowning after which the society is reborn. The deity is reborn and the society is also reborn. So, uh, in the fourth section, he suggests ritualistic drowning. And in the last section, you see a complete change from the water that is polluted, uh, from the water that drowns you to the water that brings life. He takes us to the banks of the Ganges in India, where the thunder says da. Datta dayadvam damyata. That means give, sympathize and control. Datta means give. So what is the solution for the wastelanders? How do you get back a normal life? By giving, sharing, giving. By sympathizing with others. By understanding other people. And by controlling yourself. You need self-control also. So Eliot is providing a solution to a very materialistic uh, debased modern society by evoking Eastern spirituality. He talks about Buddha. He talks about uh, Eastern Brahadaranika Upanishad. He also talked about primitive Christian cultures. He talked about Ardharian legends. He talked about Greek paganism. So modernity has its solutions in all these other cultures. He is trying to uh, show us the solution for the fragmentation of modernity. This is not one poem that Eliot wrote in one go. Okay, let me write about the condition of modernity and he wrote The Wasteland. It was not like that. He wrote this poem over many years. It had come to uh, over 1000 lines. Uh, then it was edited, edited, edited by Ezra Pound, the imagist. All the unnecessary descriptive passages were deleted and it became a very concentrated uh, form of modernist poetry with so many voices speaking from all directions, so many perspectives ultimately all united cinematographically into one narrative of fragmentation, uh, meaninglessness, disunity and its solutions. So these, all these fragmented voices that you hear in the wasteland, these fragmented perspectives are all suggested by the early title of the wasteland. He do the police in different voices. This phrase is an absurd phrase taken from Charles Dickens's Our Mutual Friend. The absurdity of the human condition, the incomprehensibility of human nature, that is what is suggested by this title. Now, the publication of The Wasteland was in Criterion. That was in October 1922. Immediately after that, the next month, it was published in The Dial in 1922 itself. Dial is an American magazine, as you know. So, this is a poem which is like uh, an ironic commentary given by a detached observer. He is talking about so many people's uh, experiences, all unified somehow by the presence of Tiresias. This is a very difficult poem, as you know. You need to read a summary and analysis in order to understand it. You need to study it. It is a very writerly text. 
it is very esoteric which is a typical style of high modernism it has been criticized by many people because of its esoteric nature and uh, the very structure of the poem is like an objective correlative this the the poem is an objective correlative for modernist society so here we talk about so many uh, aspects of the disintegrated world uh, of modernism there is a lot of frustration and pessimism of the modernist society that is represented here through surrealistic images and uh, at the end however there is a ray of hope because if uh, we give sympathize and control and if we resort to the beauty of art the unity of art then probably we can resolve our problems that is the suggestion and uh, this poem is a great expression of the values of modernism and new criticism such as irony paradox ambiguity and it is a heap of broken images and a mosaic of quotations like um, roland barth would later say it is a tissue of textualities so that is in a nutshell about the wastelands i hope you enjoyed this brief uh, overview and i hope you will read on your own uh, we have a very detailed explanation in our encyclopedia of uh, british literature as you might know you might possess a copy of it please read it and uh, in the next video i will talk to you about the other later works of ts eliot other poems his criticism and poetic plays so happy reading until the next video bye bye